Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. It's so great to see everyone adding in um, your introductions into the chat. We have some really great artists and teachers with us today. Welcome. Um, if you're just joining us, please do introduce yourself, introduce yourself in the chat feature. Make sure that that chat is going to all panelists and attendees so we can all see that. You can also send, uh, elect to send a, a message to us privately or directly as a, as a panelist. Um, but really, we want to use this for all communication as much as possible. We are recording today's session, and it will be made available after, um, after today. We'll be uh, sharing that with you, and that will be available to share out with the field. Um, we're in this moment of rapid and adaptive response, aren't we all? <laughs> uh, it's a very interesting moment we find ourselves in. Um, <clears throat> So just a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Jeremy Williams. Uh, like you, I wear many hats. For this call today, um, I'm going to be. To, I, I'm the producing director and founder of Convergence's Theater Collective. I'm also a consulting a consultant for the Building Demand for the Arts program at Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, where I lead both in-person and online community, uh, online community and learning programs, and, and also for the Doris Duke. Foundation for Islamic Art, their Building Bridges program where I produce online gatherings and media. And also I am a, fellow, a, a colleague with you. I'm a, a, an associate, or I'm sorry, an adjunct professor <laughs> teaching a hybrid graduate course in independent producing at Baruch College and their master's in arts administration program. Uh, so uh, we're, we're gonna have some other folks join us throughout the, the session today. Um, it's, it's really great to have you all with us and um, before we get started, um, I, would, I want to ask you to just pause for a moment and pull out something to write with. It could be a scrap of paper, your phone, or you're probably at a computer right now. Um, but just take a, a minute, and I'm, I want us to start with asking, to responding to this, this prompt, and we're going to do a little writing exercise. And the prompt is, how do you feel in this moment? And of course, that could be uh, your emotional state. It could also be your physical state. I feel myself sitting in the chair. I feel the warm sun coming through the window. Um, so we're gonna start now and have 30 seconds to just answer, to respond to the prompt, how do I feel in this moment? I'm gonna go on mute. And that's 30 seconds. You can stop your writing. So keep that handy. We'll come back to that in just a few minutes. But before we do that, I want to go ahead and talk about um, what we're going to talk about today uh, and the webinar objectives. So today, in today's webinar, we're going to go through some general information about how to teach online. We hosted a webinar yesterday that really unpacked this information in, in detail. And so today, we're going to go through that information a little, a little bit quickly. Uh, and refer you back to that webinar to have that unpacked because we really want to spend uh, the majority of our time, or as much time as we can today, uh, focusing on this moment of adapting and translating our syllabus specifically for the performing arts and studio arts, uh, and then give some time for, um, for some robust Q&A together at the end. Uh, so <clears throat> as, we're, as we're moving into the, the content portion of our section, I want to just invite you for a moment to just Feel your seat, feel yourself in your seat, and take a deep breath in through your nose, out through your mouth. One more time. In through your nose and out through your mouth. And we're going to just do a little guided meditation for a moment. And I want you to first imagine the land that you're sitting on right now. We're all in different places, connected by the internet, but we're sitting on some land. And I want you to imagine and acknowledge the native and first peoples that inhabited that land before you set foot on it. Giving gratitude and acknowledgement for those people, those cultures. 
breathing in through the nose, out through the mouth. Now we're gonna let that image change and we're going to imagine our ancestors, those who came before us, who paved the way for us to be here today. Breathing in through the nose, out through the mouth. And now we're going to bring our awareness up to this present. Here we are in this moment, not connecting in the way that we necessarily enjoy connecting or have a regular practice of connecting, but here we are online. And as we recognize the present moment that we're in, you know, it's also great to think about the native peoples and the first people who inhabited that land before us. And if you know who that is, great. But if not, this is a great opportunity once we wrap up this webinar to look that up. Who has come before who we can acknowledge and really um, be, be grateful for everything that has come before us in this moment. I'm speaking to you from Oaxaca City, Mexico, where I'm splitting my time now between New York and Oaxaca. And there are many indigenous groups of people here. And one group um, that, is, that has been here historically and continues to live here is, are the Mixtec people. And the, there's an origin story from the Mixtec people that, the, that we came from the clouds, which I think is really interesting because here we are connecting on the cloud in this moment, uh, feeling this connectivity in a different way, but really noticing that we are actually connected. We're 73 people connected in disparate places right now through the cloud. So as we both rapidly advance in technology, we also want to acknowledge, you know, our, where we come from, our foundations, especially as we think about our role in the performing arts. So if you would now turn back to your writing assignment and in that chat, drop in one word or one phrase about how you're feeling right now. Wow, so many feelings, so many experiences, a multiplicity. As that's coming in and you continue to do that, I wanna point you to the chat, I'm sorry, the Q&A feature. So if at any time you have a um, question along the way, unlike a traditional classroom, you can ask it at any point. So go ahead and type in that question as you have questions along the way, and we will have a, a, a formal Q&A session at the end, but uh, you don't need to wait for that to, to pose your question. So as, you, as questions emerge along the way, we invite you to use that, that question and answer feature here uh, to go ahead and type in those questions. So we wanna start by, um, talking about uh, and, and really acknowledging that this is a different learning environment that we're talking about. In-person teaching is very different than online teaching. When I started teaching online and leading online learning experiences in 2009 and 2010, I was really um, struck by how alone I felt, um, that I was not able to connect with my students and the people that I was actually in dialogue with, very much like now in this moment. And it was very ungrounding. You know, all of the, the skills that I have as a teacher and that you have as a teacher, you know, such as being able to read a room, being able to change my lesson plan uh, on a dime to respond to the moment, to be able to tailor my class plans to individual learning styles and modalities of, uh, of individual students and learning styles. And then, you know, to also, uh, to be able to understand when learning lands. None of this is possible um, from, from an online perspective. I needed to cultivate new skills. It's a very different environment. Um, that's not to say it's a bad environment, it's just very different. And so, so what, what is, some things are possible online and some things are not. And we're gonna really spend some time talking about that today. You'll see me looking for some papers. Um, as a facilitator, I always have lots of papers around. It's always good to have printed notes. I wanna also share my process a little bit. It's different. So while online is different, you know, and we can't teach the same things, we, can also, we also cannot teach in the same ways. You know, we need to trust the unknown. We need to really press into experimentation. We are trying this together. We are not experts at online. We are experts in our content areas. Um, you know, we wanna be able to fail and fail forward and learn from that and try again, and hopefully try again with a little humor and with kindness to ourselves. 
At this point, I'd like to introduce um, one of my colleagues, uh, Jennifer Edwards, into the conversation. And um, what we're really doing here today with, from Convergence's Theater Collective's perspective is that we're sharing our process with you. And we're sharing our process about, in, in order to help you think and imagine your way through this moment. And part of that is through um, some, some framework that you can do a little bit more research on your own, but we wanna introduce this one concept uh, to begin with, which is design thinking. So hey, Jennifer, it's so great to see you. Hi, great to be here. Um, let me, oh, so like me, Jennifer wears many, many hats. You can see her, some of the hats that she's bringing to this conversation on the slide now. Um, but Jennifer, I'm gonna just uh, ask you to go ahead and dive in and share your thoughts on design thinking. Sure. So um, first I'll give a really quick introduction of what design thinking is, kind of the, the meat of it, and then um, how I would approach, uh, you know, designing a class um, or retooling your existing classes um, using design thinking. So in the most simple form, design thinking takes the ideas of, of designing a, a product. It really does come from a, from a product-based model. Um, and you know, designing for the user. So in a very, really tangible example, I want you to all to think about a wrench. Those of you who were on the call yesterday, this will be familiar in the intro. Um, so think about a wrench and think about what that looks like and feels like just a standard you know, metal wrench that, that is, was designed to tighten bolts, right? Um, but a standard wrench isn't necessarily designed for all the various users. It's designed for the function to tighten the bolt, but it's not designed for all the different hands, the different um, abilities, the different sizes and shapes of hands, arthritic hands that are going to use that wrench. And so a design thinker thinks about all, all of the users, thinks about the audience, thinks about thinks beyond the functionality, right? So uh, when we apply that to curricula and we apply that to teaching, you know, often, um, you know, and, I, and I'm positive that, that all of you do think of your students when you're creating your, your syllabi and, and, and constructing your classes, but now there, it's a different format, right? This class is taking a very different format. And so you have to, again, kind of approach this concept, all the concepts that you're teaching um, with your students in mind, with your users in mind. And so the things that I would think about as, as I approach teaching online or have thought about as I, as I have taught online um, are things like, and I, I do want to say all design processes start with a discovery process. So the discovery process is really asking questions. It's, it's um, taking into account all of the assumptions that you have. And right now, you know your students, you have tons of assumptions about them, about how they behave in studio, in class. But all of those assumptions need to be tested now that you're not in studio with them. And so I would suggest that first, before you do anything with your students now that they're online, is survey them. Understand their access to technology, understand their knowledge of technology, understand their comfortability with technology. Um, before you even start to, to dive into the what you're gonna teach and how the heck you're gonna translate all this in-person teaching to online, understand who you're designing it for and really work past those assumptions that you know you're going to say, "Oh, I know my kids." Well, you don't know them yet in this um, in this format. And kids, students, um, <laughs> I've reached that age where everyone in college and high school are kids. Um, anyway, I'll pause and um, very brief introduction to design thinking. Great, thanks so much, Jen. And before you head off, I just want to underscore what you said around simplicity. That design that design thinking is about a simple approach to complex questions yeah. or complex problems, right? Not complicated, but complex, a lot of moving parts. And Jen and I are both choreographers, and so this is part of our artistic practice, is how do we animate a lot of moving parts? And design thinking is a really great way uh, of thinking about that from a conceptual place. As choreographers, we think about it from an experiential place. Today on this webinar, we're going to attempt to blend those, <laughs> thinking about how can we be both experiential and conceptual. So Jennifer, thank you for setting that framework, and we'll, we'll see you back on the camera in just a few minutes. 
So as I mentioned, we're here to share our process with you um, to help you think about um, how to make this transition. And, but you know, I really want to acknowledge first, before we even get in, say this again and again, not all, all of our teaching can be moved online. This is not a, a solution forever. This is a solution for now. Um, it, and we really want to address it for now. There, I'm, this is, we are not advocating for a move to online teaching. We are responding to this, this need and approaching it with a sense of excitement because we can perhaps learn some things along the way. So thinking about our process, we have um, two major questions we ask in the world of Convergence's Theater Collective, whether we're making a new play, a new dance, a new workshop or course, um, we ask these two central questions. One, what can I accomplish? And two, how can I accomplish these goals? These are very simple questions, what and how, but they are incredibly important. Thinking about what I can accomplish, this first question, we really wanna think, address this um, from starting where we are. You have a syllabus. You've already done this work, no problem. You also have learning goals articulated, wonderful. Go to the syllabus, pull up those learning goals, do a deep dive. Maybe some of your learning goals are implicit and not articulated. It's a good time to articulate those. Maybe they're explicit and they're already there for you. Um, you also wanna look at your available schedule and time. This is gonna vary from institution to institution, teacher to teacher. Um, you know, are you meeting once a week online for three hours? Are you able to break that up? We're not sure, but you need to look at your available time and also the time that uh, you need to give in terms of in-classroom teaching for credit hours, homework hours, et cetera. So um, really thinking about the, what do you know about time? How many times are you going to be meeting between now and the end of the semester? Um, you know, if you're, I think a lot of us are only meeting maybe six or seven times after this, you know, maybe we can only get a couple of things accomplished in terms of what can I accomplish, but we'll get there. And then thinking about resources, first start with your people. You know, the performing arts are powered by people, by humans, you know, and uh, we all have really great contacts. Maybe this is a time where you can leverage your collaborators to be in the room, be in the room with you and your students in a way that have, has never been possible before. Um, you know, maybe you, this is your first time teaching online, but you were at a dinner party and heard a friend or a colleague say, oh, I'm teaching this online course and you never thought you would have to do it, <laughs> but here you are. So think about who's doing this already, what resources you have available and make a list. So this, this is really important in terms of what can I accomplish, make a list, it's a resource assessment your syllabus, your learning goals, your schedule and time available, and your resources, which then moves us to the next question. And as a, as a reminder, we do unpack this in more detail in, in the previous webinar, which, which will be made available publicly for you to refer to later. Um, so this question around what can I accomplish, um, <clears throat> it, it is also really important, which is really speaking to the how. Sorry, I need to move a few things around on my screen that popped up. And when, I think, when we think about what can I accomplish, we're thinking about process. And we have a three-step process for this. Step one, make a plan. We always make a plan first. Sometimes that can be complex and multi-pages and full of graphics. Sometimes it can be a post-it note with a lot of lists. Doesn't matter which kind of planning you're doing, you just wanna make a plan. Uh, next, you wanna think about participation design. And finally, we want to think about facilitation, which is a slightly different role than your normal role in facilitating an online ex or in-person experience. <clears throat> so in terms of making a plan, you know, you really want to focus on the learning goals. And the learning goals will help create the structure and formats for your online teaching. Really center what you want to focus on to learn. To learn. Um, don't get caught up in all the bells and whistles of online. Uh, you know, sometimes it's nice to use video, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's nice to use a poll feature, sometimes it's not. We want to focus on the learning goals and like in creating structures and formats that lead to the successful realization of these goals. You want to think about um, your content and media. You know, what, it, what are you going to use for this um, to help, to help um, your students understand? 
you know, maybe there's some advanced reading, maybe there's some advanced video. There's so many incredible resources being shared right now in, in different ways on, about how to think about moving our content online and what content is already available online. Um, so thinking about what content would you like to share and start collecting that because this, you'll need to share that out with your students. And then finally with the plan, we really wanna take this one step at a time, <laughs> which is gonna be really challenging in this moment where it feels like we have to go so fast, so fast, so fast. Um, so we're gonna slow down and take one step at a time. And after you've you know, started making this plan and you're to this point, you wanna ask yourself, what can students do before class? Um, when we're thinking about online learning, I really think about this as transmedia storytelling. You know, that we're using multiple pieces of media, multiple platforms to tell one story, or in the case of online learning, to reach one learning objective. That there's multiple pieces of media, multiple platforms in play for us to get at one understanding. So what can students do before class? Can they watch a video? Can they, um, can they prepare an assignment? Um, what kind of media and what kind of uh, homework can, can folks do to be prepared before they step into the online environment? Once you've answered that question, then you can answer the next question. What needs to be available to students before class, before the online gathering? Making sure you send out those links, post it on Blackboard, what, you know, we're all using a million different platforms, but what needs to be available? And then also what needs to be communicated to the students um, in advance? I'm gonna point you to the guide that we published um, a couple of days ago. There's, there's some great support in there around communications. I'll just say briefly, one email is not enough. Five emails will be too many. <laughs> but think, really thinking about like, how can you prepare your students to be prepared? Moving into participation design, you know, thinking about participation design, there's a big buzzword in our field right now, which is engagement. And one, one way to think about engagement is just very simply participation and you know, performing arts, we have that in spades. This is our wheelhouse. We are great at participation in person. Let's see how we can now translate that online. So in terms of thinking about designing participation for your students, first we wanna think about formats. You know, there's various formats that you can use, like such as this presentation format here. Um, you can have a fishbowl conversation. We're gonna model that version later for you today. You could have an online discussion. Uh, you could have some team learning, working in small groups. Uh, you can also use story circles, which is a form articulated by Junebug Productions. We talked a lot about that in yesterday's we, uh, webinar. We had Stephanie McKee Anderson, the Executive Artistic Director, um, really share that, that process. But this is a really great experiential way to take a deep dive to promote in-person, um, or person-to-person -person sharing within a large group. Um, and so we'll, you, you can find those, we'll send out those resources along with you, or for you with the recordings about story circles for you to adapt those as a potential format for um, presentation or for um, participation. I wanna to point to the order of these, and these are organized by the least engaging to the most engaging. And that's something we really wanna think about online, you know, that we wanna have as much active engagement as we can. And presentations are very passive. A fishbowl conversation can be more engaging depending upon how you structure it. A discussion is wonderful, but that can be impossible if you have a large group, you know, how to manage that. You wanna think about the logistics of that. And then one-to-one -one learning uh, or team learning, group learning is super helpful. And uh, story circles, again, like a, a really deep dive into per sharing personal experience. Um, so thinking about um, platform tools, you know, there are a bunch of bells and whistles and I'm gonna invite uh, Jen, Jen back on uh, with me now to talk a little bit about platform tools. You know, in this webinar right now, we're using chat, we're using the Q&A, we're using a screen share and we're using live video. That's what we decided would be helpful. There's a lot of other features on this webinar platform we are not using right now. You should not feel beholden to use all of the tools available to you. Your tools should be selected to serve your learning. So Jennifer, you've taught a lot of different classes online, both studio classes, concept-based classes, business classes. As a teacher, can you, can you share a little bit about your experience about using platform tools for participation and engagement? 
Sure. So um, first of all, and we can't underscore this enough, uh, keep it simple. <laughs> um, things will go wrong. Uh, total insider information. This almost didn't happen today because we were panicked that the platform wasn't working right before it. It disappeared. Um, it all disappeared. We were, we were like, right, this happens. We should talk about this. Um, so, you know, things again, like Jeremy said, we're using chats, we're using the Q&A, we're obviously using video. Um, and, you know, I, I uh, would also kind of share that, you know, again, you might have students that don't have access or really good access to technology or Wi-Fi or streaming. So you want to be mindful. That's again why you do that survey. You really learn beforehand so that you can make good choices based on who you're you're working with. Um, so again, I'm, one thing I want to talk about too is um, streaming video. So video should be assigned pre-gathering, right? Pre-online gathering. Um, or uh, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, you could do kind of a, a viewing party that everybody's watching their own, you know, link on their, on their own screen and then you schedule time to come back together online. But streaming, which is a possibility on these platforms, you can stream video um, through Zoom or through um, various platforms, but we would really recommend not. It's glitchy, it's, it's not a good um, tool, and it's also not a good use of time. You really wanna use um, these tools to enhance your time together instead of getting in the way or being confusing. Um, you know, today you'll probably notice that some people are using the Q&A function, some people might use chat, and if you can think about toggling between those two things as a student, as a professor, as a teacher, it becomes distracting. And so, you know, uh, again, I would say, you know, there are also things like polls and quizzes that are available to you, which are great for engagement. You know, you really get to check in and see if people are paying attention um, by, by having them um, answer quick questions um, or, you know, give you a sense, take a temperature in the room by using polls, but you don't want to overuse these tools. You don't want to tax students' attention by giving them too many things to do over the course of your time together. So again, keep it simple, <laughs> keep it as straightforward as you can, but I would say, you know, definitely, particularly if you have, um, you know, younger students, or if you have graduate students, things like polls and quizzes can be engaging, but I would really, like I said, limit it to one or two quizzes or polls per time together, max. Absolutely, and you know, I would just wanna underscore what you were saying around the, um, the streaming video. You know, platforms say they can do a lot of amazing things, and guess what, they can. It's not that they can't do them, but the quality of the experience is so determined by the amount of broadband each individual user has. So I might get that stream perfectly while Jennifer might be struggling. As the leader, as the teacher, I don't know that Jennifer is struggling. She is now disconnected from the learning experience and is now frustrated with technology. She is no longer engaged as a learner. So this is a way, you know, again, like there's a lot of bells and whistles, but especially in the performing and our arts, quality matters. Let's not pretend that it doesn't. And so keeping this simple and thinking about effective and, and impactful ways rather than using um, all of the bells and whistles and tools that are available to you. Mm -hmm. um, so Jen, I'm gonna ask you to stay on as we move into this next section, um, which is about this, which is about facilitation. So lead, as a leader uh, and teacher and trainer online, I see myself having two roles. One, I'm the educator or the teacher, and then two, I'm the facilitator. The way that I think about that is I actually do as much of the teaching I, as I can in advance in terms of preparing people. So then when we gather together online, I can then facilitate a learning experience. This is very different, and this is because technology is in control. I am not in control as the teacher in this. Like, I, <laughs> we have to roll with it. We can only do what we, we can. Um, and, and so my role as a facilitator is really important. And so to prepare for my online experience, to host that online class, I need to think as a facilitator. 
And um, so first we want to talk about, um, you know, the role of facilitation. You know, we've said m multiple times now that you want to keep things simple. So once you have your class plan, you want to review that class plan with your facilitator hat on or through the lens of a facilitator. And you really want to keep two things in mind, simplicity and impact. Um, first of all, you want to make this easy for yourself. Let us not pretend that this is not a heavy lift right now, okay? Make this as easy as you can on yourself, first and foremost, okay? Uh, next, you also need to make it easy for the students. You know, uh, if you're toggling between a bunch of different things, la, 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 how can we streamline this, you know? But ease of use for myself, and I always think of myself first, honestly, and then I think about my students, but how can we make this a streamlined, easy experience? Um, I also wanna review my class plan to make sure that everything is meeting that one learning goal. I mentioned this in passing, but really on an online experience, you can only get a, one thing accomplished. Um, and in our, in our time left in our semester, you know, maybe you can only get three or four things accomplished in the next five or six weeks or however many weeks they have, we have left. I mean, we wanna get real simple about this. We wanna dig down into what is essential. Uh, you know, so if it's essential, is it meeting the learning goals? If not, change it, let it go, try it another time, save it for later. You're going to have a lot of great ideas. This is a generative process. But really ask yourself, is it meeting the learning goals? The third role of the facilitator is to both insert and to be comfortable with silence. We're going to have a moment of silence. We end this moment, noticing how your heart feels. Were you nervous during that? Did you want to fill it? Do you wish there were sound? Certainly as a teacher, I want to fill it <laughs> at times. And so Jennifer, I'd like to ask you to, to jump in and talk a little bit about the, the role of silence in this process. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and Jeremy, you just said this, often we feel the need as humans to fill space. Um, but a lot can surface in silence. Um, often we need time, students need time to collect their thoughts, to really respond to what your prompt is. Um, and also, you know, there is, there is real distraction. There's also a real power in silence. Um, you know, on a personal note, uh, when I have performed as a spoken word artist in the past, as, and as actors all know, to stand on stage in silence is much more powerful than to talk on stage sometimes. Um, and it holds that same gravity here online, I think. It, it offers space and it grounds everyone in, a, in, a, in an online experience in kind of the, the thoughtful process of responding to whatever's on the table. Um, also, you know, particularly if you're if you're doing a movement practice or something with your students online, um, things like music are probably not going to be very engaging or interesting. It's going to be another added layer that's that's not really interesting coming through the speaker of someone's computer when it's you know playing on the side and a speaker for you or something. So, you know, you're probably going to be moving a lot in silence, um, which might be different for your students and for you. Um, so I think that there, uh, this is a great opportunity to both use silence as a tool to give space for new ideas to surface and to experience and play in silence as a, a mover, as a teacher. Um, and then I would also like to invite you to think about different types of silence. So um, you might decide with your students to communicate using not email. You know, you might decide yeah. to, you know, <laughs> yes, um, to text or to um, use something like Slack or some, or a Google Doc, a shared Google Doc or, or GChat or something to communicate with your students. And so maybe there's kind of a, a, a quietness or a silence of the barrage of emails for your class that they're receiving from everybody else and in their classes. So think about this idea of space in, in auditory sense and silence um, as a real opportunity 
to play in different ways. That's great. You know, this is a, this, this, I, you might be hearing this, but this is a really great time to experiment, right? We are just trying some things right now. Some things will land, some things will not, you know, but what a great mo what a great opportunity we have to ask some questions in ways we have not previously asked them. Um, yeah. Which is terrifying Can in, in a way. Please do. Um, just in terms of facilitation, something that uh, came up yesterday and, and I do want to underscore, and that is time. Um, you know, I think as a facilitator and, and Jeremy, I know you're keeping time and we're all keeping track of time, but also, you know, if you're inviting students to speak, um, particularly if they're not in a theater class, right, if they're not used to speaking, um, uh, and you want to make space for everyone to speak and you want to give people parameters, you know, everyone has to speak for two minutes or everyone has to speak for, you know, a minute. Um, a, it, it, it forces folks to talk who are maybe not used to talking or communicating online, but also, you know, I do want to kind of underscore the fact that while there are maybe only one or two learning goals that you can achieve during every class, we're also achieving a learning goal in terms of communicating online. You know, people are now auditioning online. People are now interviewing online. Um, and if your students are not used to this and they're entering the field, they will have to do this at some point in time. So even just by taking the remainder of your semester online and kind of working in this way, you are achieving goals that maybe you never even set in your syllabus, right? There are, there are layers of goals that you can achieve just by showing up here. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you for underscoring that. You know, there's, there's a lot of learning and teaching going on here. We, if anything, we could, we, we want to just be mindful that there's a lot going on. So which ones are we going to highlight? You know, there's a lot of possibilities. Yeah. The last thing I want to say about, uh, uh, share about this uh, around simple and impactful facilitation is that review your assignments and make sure that they're leading towards learning. Um, that this is a developmental process, that one thing leads to the next. And sometimes, you know, that learning, we're, we're not around when that lands. Sometimes our students have those ahas years later, a month after class, da 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 No problem, but that is our practice, right, as, as performing arts teachers and, and practitioners, is that we're leading towards something, right? So really look at your class plan to make sure that it's leading towards learning. And then a couple of tools, but what, what Jennifer said, you know, I make a plan, you know, I have a plan here that is like highly annotated with time for today's session. <laughs> um, you know, you want to have a, a, an idea of how much time you need to allot for each section. It's, it's impossible to read the room in the way that we do in person. Um, you know, it's like my stage manager self really like gets kicked in, <laughs> like make the, make the, make the schedule. You also want to have a tool that's a time clock, a clock, a timer, or a stopwatch. You know, for me, honestly, stopwatches make me nervous. They don't relax me because it feels like I need to go faster. And if anything online, I need to slow myself down. So that's just a personal preference, but do have some sort of timepiece with you that works for you. And in the same way you would cue for transitions in the room, you need to think about the way that you want to cue transitions as you're moving from unit to unit, moment to moment within, um, within your plan. So that's getting us to the end of this. As I mentioned, we, we spent much more detail on this in the previous webinar. And again, that, that will be made available um, to watch uh, as a recording. We're working on that. Um, and we'll have that available very soon. But we do want to get to this uh, larger question, which is specific for us today, which is, whoops, I'm actually, I might be in the wrong document. I'm going to stop my screen sharing for a minute. <laughs> One moment, please. Indeed. Um, Jennifer, while I'm paused, can you, yeah. I'm not sure if you can do this. We're, we're moving on the fly here right now. Can you promote um, Kate and Liz to, Panelists, is that something you have the ability to do? Um, I well, I don't have bios for them, but I do. Uh... Uh, no worries. Actually, so I'm just going to let go of the screen share for now, 
and uh, continue talking together. The screen share is a tool for helping listen, but we're actually gonna move into um, a fishbowl conversation in just a moment. But before we do that, we really wanna talk about uh, performing arts online. And I do want to say that I do not feel that online is the ideal learning environment for the performing arts. However, it is a really great alternative when we cannot be together. But it begs this question around what are we teaching in the performing arts? And I've really been thinking about that and I think we teach three different things. We teach performance technique, we teach artistic practices, and we teach creative process. And I'd be happy to get into a debate with you all later on, on that. But for this conversation, we want to look at those and keeping it simple as these three different things. And for me, this, this relates to this idea, um, you know, like a performance technique is the ground, the foundation of our work as artists, right? What is that foundation? And artistic practice is the path or the way. How do we do it? You know, and then creative process is an understanding how we arrive at that and how we can repeat it and share it with each other. It's like, an, it's like fruition, you know, from a, a Buddhist perspective, ground path fruition, it's very connected to see how I, how I see us teaching performing arts, laying the groundwork through technique, showing and revealing the path via practices, and then having artists come into their own fruition through understanding and working with the creative process. Technique might be really hard to teach online. If you're a ballet teacher, it can be really hard to have a bar online. If you are a music teacher, how are you holding sectionals online? This is, there's something about technique that can be really challenging to, to teach online, but practices and creative process are two areas that we include in our, in our teaching, but not always explicitly. Um, and Jen, I'm gonna invite you to, to talk a little bit about that while I bring uh, Liz and Kate on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, in talking about uh, this um, gathering specifically, I started th to think about um, both big aha moments for myself when I was a student in uh, university and then moments in teaching and in, in my professional life. Um, and two things really stuck out as from my time as a student. And one was I remember a moment in ballet class with Terry O'Connor. And he kind of turned to us all and he said, you know, when you, when you get out into the world um, and you don't have money for class, how are you going to stay in shape? How are you going to keep your technique up? And I think we all went, what, what, <laughs> you know, we can't have class every day. What, how are we going to do that? And it was this huge moment where we really got into a dialogue as a class about it. We stopped class, we all talked. And and I was thinking about that in this context, as you all are moving online, and we all know as, as professors and as teachers, we have those moments in class where you just feel it. You feel that the students need to talk about self-care. You feel that the students need to talk about, you know, a career in the arts. You know that you, um, you know, that students are just having that day where they need to really learn, learn and talk about um, developing a, a way of being in the world as an artist that's not about going to the bar that's not about going to the easel that's not about you know practicing your scales and so in in this context we have the opportunity to do some of that teaching that we know how to do already right we know how to hold those conversations we know how to introduce those concepts we know how to lead students to other forms of information that will help them when you're not there that will help them when they're no longer in school. So that's one. Um, and I won't go through all my whole list. But the other thing is, you know, as a teacher, how do we deal with injury with students who are injured? And often we have to move, you know, a big moving section into a chair dance. We have, you know, when, a, when there's a hamstring issue or a calf issue or something, you know, how do we navigate those moments? And in many ways, that's going to be the next few weeks for you, right? How do you navigate that as a professor when you, do, when you are constrained by a circumstance? Um, and often a lot of rich, amazing stuff comes out of those moments, you know? Um, lastly, I'll just talk about um, kind of what we take for granted uh, in terms of folks who have space. Um, I remember writing about a piece of, um, about a chore Congolese choreographer, Faustan Lani Akula, uh, several years ago. He, he was talking about his work, um, 
And, you know, he had been trained in Europe, studio space, blah, blah, blah. He moved back home to Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, as a choreographer and realized there was no studio space. Everything had to be made in living rooms of his performers' homes and his own living room. And so there's a lot of, and he was performing at the kitchen. That's why I was writing about him in New York City. Um, and so I think about all the things that we think we, we need that maybe we don't. You know, maybe, maybe we can use this time to play uh, in ways that we know how to play. We know how to do this. So I'll pause. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, it's so true. We do this in many ways already, you know, and that's so relaxing to hear. <laughs> There's a lot of new coming at us all right now, but we know, we do know things. We do have wow. experience with it. You know, we, we're doing this and it's a reframing. That's how I'm thinking about this as a reframing, not a start from scratch. And so um, as we think about that, as we think about this reframing, you know, there's, we, we started with the question, what can we do? And then we had the question, how can we do it? And we had those three steps. But then this question around how do we adapt and translate our syllabus and class plans for online? And to have this conversation where, I mean, you can see that Kate Amory, Kate Bowler Amory and Liz Stanton have joined us. Both are, um, uh, they're two of my, uh, two, two of four uh, producing partners with Convergence's Theater Collective. Uh, Kate is a, is a producer, project visionary, and co-founder. She is a professor of acting, movement, and devising theater. Uh, Liz with CTC is a theatrical development producer and project visionary. Uh, she is also a professor of voice, movement, and acting. We're going to model our process for you uh, and also model what an, a fishbowl conversation might be like as a format for engagement for you today. Um, so we're going to ask you to participate along with us actively. Uh, we're gonna go into um, a dialogue between the four of us um, and practice adapting class plans, which need to be, which both of these professors need to do. Neither of these professors have taught these classes or any classes online. So, uh, <laughs> so they are being very brave uh, to share their process with you and with us as we collectively seek to solve these problems, which is how we work in Convergence's Theater Collective. It is the power of the collective to creatively come up with solutions for this. So as, um, as, as an audience on this, we want you to be in the mind of the student. And guess what? You are learning how to teach online. So here you are as the student. And we want you to participate through with this, with, along with us in this fishbowl conversation uh, through the chat. Now, this is really interesting because in person, when we do a fishbowl conversation, you know, often maybe it's in a panel and we're over here, there's a circle and we're all sitting around. You know, the audience doesn't get to talk, right? They just get to listen and observe. But now in this format, it is not distracting to have multiple conversations simultaneously. In fact, it can be enriching. So we're gonna give you a little framework about what we would like to hear from you as we're having this conversation. We would like to, you to respond to the three different topics below in the chat. There are three different categories. One, you can talk about things you appreciate, things that catch your interest, ideas that spark you, things that um, you appreciate. Um, another category or topic you could think about is inquiry, such as what questions are emerging? What would you like to know more about? What doesn't feel clear? And then finally, recommendations. There are a lot of smart people. Actually, uh, everyone on this call is brilliant because we're performing arts teachers. <laughs> uh, so it, we all have some recommendations. So there are three different ways that you uh, can participate in this fishbowl as we move forward, sharing your thoughts about what you appreciate, your inquiry, and your recommendations. I will say in the room, if we are facilitating around this and you went off topic, I would course correct. I'm not going to course, I won't be able to do that in chat. So I will ask you to stay true to these three. This is what we're asking. We would appreciate this from you. This would be of use for us. Uh, so if we ask you to stay within these three categories for now. If you have a, something outside of that, please send me a private chat or something different. Uh, you'll notice we're not asking for what didn't work. And that's um, actually really important here. Appreciation, inquiry, and recommendations. With that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna invite Kate and Liz to come off mute.
thank you all for joining us today. We've, we've, this is a continuation of conversations we've been having today, and now we're just moving it online. Um, Kate, do you mind saying hello just so we can check your volume? Hello, am I audible? We, yes, we can hear you. Hi, where, everyone. Where are you today? Uh, I am in uh, beautiful Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Excellent. And Liz, can you say hi and check volume? Hey, everyone. It's Liz. And where are you today, Liz? I am in Hell's Kitchen, Manhattan. Manhattan, great. And I didn't include your titles. Would you just briefly give us your institutional titles as professors? Sure. Uh, I am currently a professor at the Boston Conservatory at Berkeley in Boston, and I, I teach in the Contemporary Theater Program, and I also teach in the Musical Theater Program, and I teach uh, movement and psychophysical acting and other uh, scene study courses, as well as devising, directing, original creation. Excellent. And Liz? Sure. I am an adjunct at the New York Film Academy currently. I teach voice and movement. I teach monologues, teach Meisner, and um, I also teach in, have taught that uh, the producing class with you. <laughs> <laughs> and at NYU's Experimental Theater Wing. Uh, yeah, ongoing. sometimes I'm there. Sometimes I'm there, yeah. So we're coming at this from multiple hats. And so what we're going to do right now, if Liz, you want to put yourself on mute for a minute, we're going to start with Kate. And Kate, here you are. Here we are together. I've asked you to prepare your first class plan idea. And what I'd like to do today is have you share that with us. And then Jennifer and I are gonna ask you some questions about that uh, and kind of engage in some dialogue to unpack that. And we're gonna invite Liz to join in um, at any time, Liz, if you have an idea or a question or would like something to add along the way. It's our way. Uh, so just even though we're online, if we were sitting around the table, your voice would be very included. Just because that mute is on doesn't mean you should be muted. Uh, so we invite your voice, thank you. So Kate, take it away. What are you, what are you teaching? How's it, what, what's uh, going to go online? Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, and thank you for hosting this. Uh, so as suggested, uh, I went back and looked at my syllabus and looked at what we have remaining in the last seven weeks of class this semester. And uh, the class that I chose to talk about today is a scene study class for musical theater junior level students. And uh, we had just completed a unit on uh, absurdism and Beckett in scene studies. And we were embarking after spring break on a unit on Shakespeare scenes. Mm. And so I had just given them scenes to go away and learn for spring break and um the focus of the unit was on embodying shakespeare uh while integrating <laughs> yeah, exactly. can we laugh at that for a minute can we just enjoy the humor for a moment because yeah. we have to laugh or we'll go crazy yeah so. exactly, exactly. <laughs> um while also incorporating um an understanding of the language and uh, applying scansion, but mostly we really were going to focus on uh, what we've been focusing on all year, which is it, truthful behavior in fictional circumstance. And so in thinking about how to translate that overall learning objective into a digital context, I had to think really deeply about what it means to be in a mediated fictional reality as opposed to a live fictional circumstance, i.e. a play as opposed to um, something recorded or filmed or happening digitally. Um, and so I was exploring different options. At first, my assumption was I should switch to monologues. Oh, change your plan? To change my plan. <laughs> At first, I thought, probably from my own anxiety, 
um, I thought, well, let me switch to Shakespeare monologues. That will be more manageable. That will be more fruitful. They will be able to work in solo, record them. I can, I can critique them in live, um, like WebEx or Zoom. Um, they could record them. Um, we could critique them as a group. Uh, we could apply lots of skills we've learned at that. And then I stepped back and I thought, but that's actually not my learning objective. My learning objective, mm -hmm. my stated learning objective has to do with action and reaction. Ah. And, and it's not that in monologues, you're not reacting. Of course, you are responding and you are responding to imaginary circumstances, but that would deprive the students of the opportunity to explore what it would be like to work with uh, scenes in relationship while across a digital platform. And I thought, well, let's just see what happens if I imagine ways of doing that, even if we discover it's really hard or it's not so fruitful, there would be learning that happened uh, through that process. And so a couple of ideas that I'm gonna throw out that I haven't specifically landed on yet, but would be um, what if the actors kept their scenes and rehearsed with phones on speaker or laptops if they so chose, uh, or tablets, honestly, um, but only without video, just with audio to begin with, so that they could rehearse in their separate spheres, audio to audio, um, without worrying about capturing video or the or feeling uh, silly on video. Yeah. Right. Exactly. I think that's a real thing to consider, right? I feel silly to explore sometimes on video. I feel silly in the room, let alone yeah. when you don't have anyone to physically respond to. Yeah. I like right. That. Exactly. So so to to think about their experience and maybe um, baby steps towards a, a, a video relationship. Um, so starting with audio and having them work by calling each other, working on their scenes, and then sh maybe sharing that just in audio with us first, especially because it's Shakespeare. Um, there's something very valuable in just listening to the play. Um, and then graduating towards uh, video and working across a video platform. Another thought that I had was um, in recording their own side of the scene in audio and then sending it to their partner so that their partner can work with obviously gaps in between so that their partner could work physically corporally in, in an embodied way in relationship to the mediated sound of their partner so that they're working live but they're working in relationship to mediated text which is something i've done in my own performance work a lot and it had it was sort of a later aha moment of like oh there's real value in that 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 i can have a live response to uh recorded text mm -hmm. um and then also it could be video. They could record video of themselves and send it to their partner as well. But again, I like the simplicity of starting with um, listening to each other. And then the other possibility that maybe then gets complex and interesting or maybe is too complex would be the option that they could use GarageBand or some other platform if they're comfortable with that to actually distort, modify, expand, change, even using viewpoints, dynamics, um, to, to change uh, the recorded text so that they're responding to text that has now been mediated by themselves. So that they're thinking about creating a performance in response to um, something that's dynamic and that they're in a creative process with. So those are some thoughts I've had about where to go in a traditional scene study class that's suddenly not traditional. traditional. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. so great. Thank you for sharing that. I, want, I just wanna do a quick feedback and share some things that I heard that I appreciate. And then I'd like to invite Jennifer and Liz to jump, jump in on a couple there. I appreciate that you're thinking about this in a developmental perspective. First, audio then video maybe and then later maybe mixing media 
are like distorting working with the media as media, right? As a, as a, as a tool. So already you're thinking about a step, a progressive sequence, right? Um, and so it's really great to hear that. I also like this idea of the simplicity of the audio, you know, that you, um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Jen at that point. I have many more, but I'm getting a note that my signal is unstable. So. Um, yes, uh, not to, not to belabor a point, but I do love the, um, the progression. I love the, uh, the fact that you're, it sounds to me like you're leaving it up to the students also to say, hey, here's a range of things that you could play with um, and let them design a little bit for themselves how, how these scenes are going to be um, workshopped um, between the, the, the students. Um, and I also love this aha moment that you had that you said, wow, I, I use this in my own practice <laughs> as an actor. And so there's that, and that added layer that we touched on before of giving them tools that that they might not necessarily have gotten from you if this hadn't happened <laughs> you know that that real life um piece uh liz um hey trying to discover how i can go off mute without scooting around the computer screen um <laughs> <laughs> yeah kate i mean this is it's it's in it's really it's great how you're um, allowing the students to to empower them themselves and how they can how they can progress through and I love I love that it's a step at a time yeah I hadn't thought about audio only um, yeah I I mean it feels it feels empowering and embracing the new technology. Mm. Thanks, Liz. So Kate, I'm going to come back to you and say, what questions do you have right now? Like what feels unclear? What would you like more clarity on personally as a leader? Like what, what questions are floating around right now that are not solved? Questions that I have are how to respond to the very real feeling that I understand from the students that they're worried this is going to be, uh, I'm just going to quote some things, uh, a waste of time, mm -hmm. not real learning, mm -hmm. uh, confusing, stupid, <laughs> um, made up work, um, happening in uh, to too rigorous a structure of expectations where they're going to be assessed on things they don't understand what the assessment metrics are too not structured enough um too much of a free-for-all so i'm hearing a lot of fear and anxiety uh, totally understandably from my students i'm feeling fear and anxiety mm -hmm. as a teacher so i would really uh start from a place with with them when i meet with them of of just from that point, and, and one thing I actually, um, I'm planning on doing is trying to engage with them before the first day of, of our online meeting, uh, just on the phone to, to try to figure out uh, if they have really strong preferences so that I'm including them in designing uh, how we move forward. And certainly first steps, you know, certainly first week, back after break. Um, so I guess some of my questions are um, other than really letting them know I'm listening, letting them know it matters to me what their, that my principal interest is what their user experience is going to be and, um, and allowing for silence and sitting with them in the uncertainty um, my, uh, I guess this isn't so much a question exactly, but I don't know yet whether my institution is going to go to pass fail. It's a request uh, many of the faculty are making. Mm -hmm. If my institution does go to pass fail, I feel that that has much more integrity and authenticity in terms of assessment at this moment. It's really hard. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in on that one because that is a can of worms that we cannot touch today, unfortunately, just because of time, you know. And so let's. I want to pin that question. You need to be having those conversations with your department, with your faculty, 
advocate for your students passing and passing well. You know, but, so, but I want to circle back only yeah, because thanks. of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a, it's a big one. It's a big one. But I want to just point us back to this first question, you know, around how to respond to the students' fear and anxiety. And you mentioned one way, which is to be in contact with them to begin with. And, and then that follow up to that, you actually mentioned two ways, is to get their buy in, right? And so I want to turn it to Jennifer and, and to see if you have any tips or recommendations for Kate on this question on how to respond to fear and anxiety from the student. Yeah, I mean, I think the two kind of practical tactical pieces would be, you know, one, having that conversation or, or polling them, surveying them before that first online class. The second is really going through your rubric um, your, for each of these assignments and um, seeing if things need to shift or change and being really transparent about that. Um, you know, I've had so many students in the last few years ask me for my rubrics around every graded, graded assignment, which I never even knew existed as a student, to be perfectly clear. <laughs> I'm always amazed at how these creative folks are now so focused on structure. But, um, uh, but I would say, you know, just being really transparent about how you're assessing them in this new um in this in this new uh, ecosystem is really important mm -hmm. thank you for that i'm going to trend this we're going to be very postmodern and say this conversation ends now but of course this conversation does not end uh, uh i, I want to acknowledge a, a comment that came in uh from a dance teacher saying that i would like to hear from a dance teacher we're not doing that right now uh i'm, I'm sorry you know we're, we're doing our best to respond uh in in a broad sense for, for many studio classes. If you have specific questions, we, we are available to work with you and your department um, to, to do that. But uh, we're hoping that some of these, uh, that there is some translation you'll need to do, but this is the, we're not gonna go into every discipline in, this, in the time that we have available. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it to, to Liz, who's also teaching in theater, but not acting. So we're gonna go to a different set of practices. And Liz, you're teaching movement and voice currently. And um, if you could just very briefly describe to us your, not briefly, I wanna change that word. That sounded too fast. I am feeling the pressure of time right now. I would rather you maybe give me some pith. What are you thinking about? Some concise, most, I'll what's, try what's and be What's most concise. important How's to that? you? What's most essential to you? But don't rush. Please. Great. So I am teaching um, voice and movement. It's a class called voice and movement. So they're combined together. And I'm also teaching a monologue class, but I, I want to focus on this voice and movement class because I'm concerned and, um, but I'm also excited because uh, I, I was going back through what we had learned um, or what we, had covered in the last couple of weeks and we had done a mirroring exercise and i and and then they were pulling sound from each other so basically the exercise started in physical movement and then i split the couples so that um one person was making sound and the other person was moving in reaction to the sound so um so and then they ended up pulling sound out of each other in that way and what I just, what just occurred to me is I might try to return to that same type of exercise um, because they've done it, but we're going to do it on a new platform online. And I could use the breakout group sections to pair them together and they could work on their own for a while and then come back to the class, to the classroom. Um, so that's, that's one idea of taking something we've already done and repeating it in a new platform and me just seeing how that works. So that's one, that's one um, way in that I was thinking of. The other uh, idea, one, another idea I've come up with is to usually we're sitting on the floor and we're working in low level we rarely use the chairs except for to put our bags on them and um, now I am imagining people will be sitting in chairs in front of their computer or their phone and I thought it would be fun to work movement wise in a way of how to interact with a chair so pedestrian 
use of a chair, sitting and standing, but maybe with different um, physical choices and, and discovering character perhaps or emotional quality as we sit and stand. We could discover tempo. And so we could work through those kind of pedestrian uses of chair. Then I thought I would share a very short video, this Justin Timberlake um, video. And um, it's, it's this chair choreography. And um, then I thought I would have them try to mimic it or mimic a 10 seconds of it. Mm -hmm. So I have to, I'm gonna pause right now Great. to get, some, to get let, let you have some voice in this. But I want to say one more thing before I pause is, I am nervous because I have two hours and 50 minutes as a class and I'm required to fill that time. So thank so, you for pointing to that. You know, that this is, so some of us, have, we touched on this in the previous webinar about how to structure and if you can restructure and how long attention spans are online. Without rehashing that right now, I'm gonna say, oh wow, three hours. Uh, yeah, so, I, <laughs> um, you know, thinking about how to break that up into different units and sections and, and engaging multiple ways, you know, it's great. I love, I appreciate many of the things that you've said. I'm going to start with, I appreciate the repetition of starting where you ended in the last class and repeating that in an online. I think that is a great way to check in and see, show the differences. We started this conversation about it's, learn, it's a different learning environment online and in person. So to give the students that experience without pressure, like we've done this once before, that feels very safe, but it also feels open to learning uh, and, and to experiencing, which is great. Um, I also really enjoy this idea of sitting and standing and working with a chair because it speaks to, you could do that online. You could also, if someone doesn't have online accessibility, you could write that instruction to them, right? They could do that assignment without having to be online, which is huge. And it doesn't require a lot of things. You need a chair or a surface right. to sit upon. You don't need a lot of space. You know, in theater and dance and movement, especially in movement and dance, we need space. It's our primary tool in many ways. So I love how you're translating this like need to be in space to this very practical like, well, we do actually sit up, need to learn how to sit up and down and then also letting that evolve into a more abstract or more artistic or choreographic, uh, poetic exploration of chair. Those are some things I appreciate. Uh, Thanks. Jen? Um, I, well, first of all, I'll own the fact that I am, um, and you'll all experience this when you start teaching online, I'm distracted by the fact that I'm reading and listening yeah. um, to two <laughs> different things. Um, so owning that. Um, <laughs> Uh, and also trying to think, how am I going to address Liz and some of these questions at the same time, which is not the exercise. Um, and so also saying, as a professor who teaches online, this is a common problem, right? Yeah. Um, so, but what I do uh, really appreciate, Liz, is, um, is the approach that you're taking, again, trying to stick to the exercise, but also saying, okay, what are all of the variables that are going to change? Uh, and I think that that's a great place to start from, right? Like, because we could look at just the exercise or we could actually look at the parts of the exercise and pull it apart um, and say, okay, what translates, what doesn't? And it sounds like you're really walking down that path. I think the other thing um, that Jeremy mentioned as well, and I think it's um, a great opportunity for both Liz and Kate is to really involve the students in the process yeah. of making and planning in a way that they just weren't involved before. You know, the syllabus was, you know, came to fruition before the class mm -hmm. started, maybe even before these kids even came into your sphere, you know, these students came into your sphere. So I think, you know, there, there is a real opportunity to address some of that fear and to address some of that unknown by inviting the students into the process of figuring out how to do this. And so I think, right. for instance, yeah, like the, the chair and how are we going to do that? And is it going to be on video across the room or is it, you know, how, how does this change and how do we personalize it to the student is, is, um, kind of tantamount to this being interesting and not feeling like a waste of time. 
for the right. student. Right. The student. Yeah, because this is an experiential class. Exactly. And all and and I would I, like to say all ex, all performing arts are experiential. Like we can't, you know, the, even when we're in a dance history class or a theater history class, we're still wanting to experience the history. You know, so this is why I think this crosstalk, you know, it, it's beneficial to all performing arts teachers because we're talking about translating an in-person experiential learning to an online experiential learning. We can't let go of the experience of it. And with that, I'm right. going to turn it to Kate and ask you for any, uh, anything that you appreciate about Liz's um, plan here. Yeah, I, I love uh, the whole idea. I'm borrowing all of it <laughs> from my book <laughs> class. Um, but I, I think that the, the thing I want to share, just because I, I, I work very somatically, um, is the picking up the exercise that you already did in the room with them that was physical and vocal and then building on that um seems really wise and useful because so much of what we do is first we experience first we we explore improvisationally and we have an improvisational experience that's corporal and sensorial in performing arts and then we repeat it and then we repeat it and and uh, capture it and we capture it in in live theater through our you know probably our prefrontal cortex right we 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 create a, a form out of it and then that form becomes repeatable and you know we call that blocking or gesture um and uh, being able to, to reference that improvisational experience that they had in the room together and then think about ways in, in which you could continue that process, uh, not in the room together, but it's still referencing a real live event that they shared. I, there's something really elegant about that to me. Thanks. Great. So Liz, we're gonna um, turn it now to you. Like what questions, where, where are your questions? Is it going to work? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> we don't know till we try. Yeah, oh, I mean, we don't know. I'm actually, yeah. the, the thing about having a longer class period is I think I do have time to really talk through and not talk through, but we have time to explore. And, oh, is this working? Great, let's keep going with it. Oh, this isn't quite working. What can we do to make this better and honestly that's what I I say that in my classroom all the time mm -hmm. and um, I was just thinking about you know I do that ball toss game I'm sure many of us in this forum do a, ball, a we toss the ball to each other to give and receive and to share our voices and share our breath or whatever we might do and when I taught a class where we had to be six feet away and I didn't want to toss something that we were all going to touch, <laughs> we ended up tossing sound. And so I introduced the, you know, link ladders, vowel ladder, and we tossed those sounds. And then we had multiple balls of sound going around the room. I just wonder if we can do that in Zoom. Like, I'm willing to try. So, uh, you know, I, but you asked me a question and I gave you a new idea. And I'm going to, and because of time, we're going to need to try. That. Yeah, yep, we're going to, we're going to transition away. But I think that's a really yeah. big question. How will it work? And we, How will it work? in the same way in the performing arts, we don't know until we put it in front of an audience, no matter what our yeah. discipline is. And this is a new way of putting work in front of an audience. We're, 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 we're exposing ourselves as teachers as not knowing you know, yeah, that can be really, I'm willing to not know. that's good. That's good. But that maybe not all of us are, you know, and I think our, our, I think that's a real question around how can we, or what level of vulnerability are we willing to share with our students in this process? You know, and I yeah. think that's something that we all need to be mindful of and answer for ourselves, you know, that, you know, to be honest, like I'm not an expert at teaching online, but I am an expert of this. But like we're learning together and, you know, this is a real redistribution of power. Even more horizontal. Even more horizontal. For those of yeah. us who are used to like a horizontal approach to working like the viewpoints or composition where all elements we work in a natural hierarchy emerging rather than the top down. 
right. right? The director or the choreographer da, 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 down, you know, the professor, you know, this is the technology is honestly in charge in this moment. And we have to, we can only test and try. And I've had massive fails. I've had massive successes. And I want to turn now to ask uh, Kate and Liz this question. You know, we've been online with Convergence's Theater Collective in many ways uh, together. You all individually have also experienced and, 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 and worked with different ways of collaborating and learning online. I would like for you to each share a, 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 a brief experience of when it worked. We've been talking about our fear of it not working. So I want to just hear what's one moment that has worked for you in the past. And let's start with Liz. Uh, well, I, I, it, when I'm, when I'm collaborating with Convergence's Theater Collective uh, folks across the country and now the world, um, what works is having a plan, having an agenda, and knowing what's next, and then listening. Mm. Listening, yeah. allowing for time because um, the voice and, and the video doesn't always line up. So I need, there's time in between and that's okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So that's my experience with CTC. Wonderful. Kate, yeah. can you share, a, would you mind sharing a, an experience of working online that has gone well for you in the past? Yes, um, I, I would um, just point out a, a project that I did where I, I began uh, devising a show with students uh, at the end of the spring semester. I assembled an ensemble, we gathered, uh, we didn't spend a whole lot of time together, but we spent uh, a couple of sessions together enough to have um, real commitment and buy-in on the project and to lay out the territory that we were gonna explore and to set some goals for each other that we were gonna hold each other accountable for over the summer. And then we used really simple uh, a platform that at the time they chose, which was Facebook, to hold ourselves accountable. And we created a common physical practice that we shared over the summer. And, they, uh, and then also some research and um, devising strategies and plans. Uh, on Pinterest and at the time um, Tumblr before Tumblr got super complicated and was just a blog um, and it was incredibly successful and when we came back as an ensemble together in September to develop the piece uh, the the students had remarkably stayed in touch every day and had created a tremendous amount of work that we hit the ground running on. And they also could do 100 push-ups, 100 sit-ups. They could run five miles. I mean, and they were not in great shape in the spring. <laughs> they all spent, all 16 of them spent the summer training alone together. But together, yeah. Alone together, yeah. And so presenting mm -hmm. that model of alone mm -hmm. together, like I am definitely going to draw on that in this and um, have already spoken with my um, my department about offering a community practice class for the whole, uh, my whole um, particular program where I will just offer to do that and lay out some protocols and <laughs> offer support and, and then let them go. And if it's TikTok they use or whatever, whatever app whatever. they're using, it yeah. doesn't matter. It's about the alone together. Yeah, and thanks for bringing that up. I love that idea of alone together. You know, and this was coming at a time where you had a semester break. Now we have this, in the middle course break, right? But nonetheless, it's kind of the same context in that we had time together and then we're gonna have time away. And I love this idea of, of how can technology help us be accountable to each other, to each other, not to the professor, right? But student to student, right? That, they, that they're looking at developing their cohort and their, and their ensemble and their connectivity to each other, their network, without having to pass through the teacher, the professor, right? So this is another way that technology can also distribute that and hopefully make your life easier. Did you have to check in on them all summer or do a lot of work to keep that going? Oh, not great. at all. Yeah. No, yeah, not at all. Themselves. Exactly. So when you have buy-in, you know, you, they're, they're, it's remarkable. And I would imagine that they continued that after that project, that that wasn't limited to that, you know? Once you have that, that group going, you know, it, it, did, do you have any sense of that? Well, sure. Yes. Yeah. 
actually. It was, it was a project was eight years ago and they're all actually still a, a Facebook group and they're all still very connected after long after graduation and spread around the country. And now they working are, professionally. Yeah. yeah. And they're all working oh, how great. Support each other. Yeah. Shout out. I mean, literally <laughs> some of them still train together physically over space. That's great. Well, I want to be mindful of our time. I, I, I have been seeing questions coming. We have only about five minutes left of our agreed upon time together. I'm seeing, I'm a little overwhelmed, I have to say, uh, because many of you have participated with by adding your questions into the chat, which is interesting because we asked you to add them into the Q&A. And your students will do that too. They will choose how they want to. But right now, Jennifer and I are sorting through, I can see our eyes darting between boxes. <laughs> And I we're going to start with some of the ones in the, in the formal Q&A. Here's what I would like to propose, though. We will address all questions, not in this webinar right now, but we will, the four of us, will respond to your questions and we'll provide a response to those questions publicly along with the recorded um, session. So all questions will be responded to in the best of our ability, but not in this moment, which is another tool you can offer your students. Sometimes the time ends, but how can we can keep it going? And so just because our time is ending here doesn't mean that this conversation between us needs to end. So just very briefly, um, there's one question here about, can you tell us about breakout rooms and how they work? You know, we can't. That's actually not why we're here talking today. You know, and uh, go to your IT folks, go to your IS folks, go to the, the platform specialties, like, you know, go there. You know, we're really focusing on how to translate content online and the how to of teach online. So we are actually, not those folks right now. Individually, Jennifer and I both do those things, but in this context, you know, I would really just recommend going to the people who are the real experts, which are your institutional IT and IS folks. Um, um, so, so someone asks, uh, regarding content, I'm intuiting that I will need to move away from encouraging scene and study, mon scene studies and monologue, scenes and monologues that dig too deep, as I worry that some might get triggered which I find is so common these days. Things I can navigate with the actor while being able to hold on to the room, but, but will have so little confidence in being to do so the same remotely. You know, and I think that's, that's a really great question. Again, it gets into the what. So maybe, maybe now is not the time to dig into the like super emotionally charged content. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe it's a time to look at, uh, you know, uh, something simple as like um, call and response or timing or, you know, listening in different ways or dramaturgy, either physical dramaturgy or historical dramaturgy to the scene work. You know, not forgetting that we have a whole field of research at our fingertips as performing artists. Uh, and so you're right, maybe asking a, a student to go into either a, a physical work that is too hard that needs to be supported in the room I would never ask a dancer to work on fuertes without me in the room for the first time, especially on point. That would be dangerous. Um, you know, the same thing is true of emotional material. We want to think about our, emotion, our, 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 our students' well-being. So then asking again this question around what is possible, you know, to get a little bit creative about that. Um, Liz or Kate, do you have uh, any, any feedback on that or follow-up response to that question? No? Jen? Um, uh, around triggering. Um, you triggering think, and material. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think in general, and I think, you know, Jeremy, you, you answered it well, but I do think, you know, in, in terms of material, try to keep it light. You just don't know once someone is outside of the, the educational space, what their home life is like or who is there to catch them or support them. So I think it's really important to um to be mindful of that and then piggybacking off of what jeremy shared um in terms of movement and, and body uh awareness you know when you're teaching movement when you're teaching dance uh you warm up in a very specific way you can't necessarily count on your students to be able to or to, to know yet exactly what they need in terms of warming up so i would keep movements similarly protective of, of the body and the emotional state of your, your students. I right. would also add that one of the benefits of starting at, at this point halfway through the semester is that I suspect um, safety protocols and safe words or practices or rituals 
have already been established. And so I think um, reminding uh, students of those and creating a, a digital version in conversation with the students would be appropriate. Um, I have those practices in my classroom and I would definitely think about, you know, what's an online version of moving forward with those practices. I also want to just I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. about um, feedback and having safe feedback protocols too, that's all. Absolutely, sorry to jump in there. I do want to be mindful of time. We are at time. A real quick recap. We will respond to all of these questions and we will share those responses with everyone who is on this webinar. Again, we guided our questions today. First, what can I accomplish? And how will I accomplish these goals? We're gonna answer that with three additional questions. Make a plan, design for participation, work on your facilitation. What do we teach? We teach technique, practices, and process. Think about what can translate online. There was a great question around, I'm you know, difficult to teach technique online. You're right, it is. Like, uh, you know, and we really wanna like, be creative in how we do that. So there are, there's also some questions around, um, you know, can we share some resources? Yes, we can share some resources. There's also two really great Facebook groups. Kate, can you give us the name of those groups that for the theater? Or actually, all performing arts. There's one. Uh, there's the remote teaching for the performing arts on Facebook, and then there's right. the uh, movement and stage combat group. Oh, and there's another, there's several then. Okay, so we'll send out in the follow up to this. We'll send the slides and we'll we'll point you to that. But there are a ton of resources online right now, you know, and so. Um, we have, you know, we're going to make this webinar available as, as in the, the past webinar about teaching online. We also have a guide. Um, we'll be sending that out to you. And we also offer training for faculty, for your faculty. Uh, so if you need more support, ask your chair to get in touch with us. We are, we are un unfortunately, we're unable to support on an individual level right now. Um, but we are happy to work with institutions to provide online training um, for you and all of your faculty peers. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, Kate, and Liz for joining us. Thank you all, all for joining us today on this call. It's been a pleasure, a crazy time, but I am so grateful to be connected with you all in this time of craziness, bringing a little bit of sanity to the situation. Thank you for your time and your experience. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you. All right, everybody. Have a great day. We'll be in touch soon. Bye.